model. I mean, are they thinking enough about the the successful livability issues and you know the the people to really to pull this off in a big way? I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, we built a city for a million people. That's great. Mm -hmm. But then you compare it to the one point whatever billion there are. How, how do you think they're doing and are going to do longer term here? And then how do you think we're going to do longer term? <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, they are uh, planning for the, their, their own population growth. They know, I mean, that's why they're moving uh, 60 million, 16 million people into cities every year because they can't support them on the farmland in the, out in the countryside. So then they have to have jobs for all those people. Right. right. And um, they don't want so much pollution because they already have enough. And so they, so they have to get off coal. They're building as many nuclear power plants as they can. You know, uh, but they're building wind and they're building solar uh, like crazy. But they build a lot of the solar out in the desert, and then they're shipping it in by high voltage uh, direct current. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't know that you could build efficient solar plants on top of buildings. They just didn't believe it. Uh, well, you know, they, <laughs> they're starting to become aware of that. Yes? Are these slides in the open? Can you take these slides or is that Because I couldn't read all the condenser and I'm wondering if that's something that's Yeah. I can make them available. So, and then, but long term. Long term, they're planning for it. Next year or so elections, just like we have. So they've got the dogmatists on both sides of the spectrum just shouting and screaming. Hmm. Um, what's interesting, what's really interesting is that you actually see it openly in the press these days in China. Okay. When I was living there, I could see it in people's daily every day, all the fights that were going on in the leadership between the lines. If you only read the straight text, it looks like everything, everybody agrees on everything. But when you look between the lines, you know, what does that mean? What did they say last week? What are they saying this week? How did it change? How did it get reframed? And from that, you can tell that they're having an argument, right? <laughs> And they would say things, well, some, some people think that, but really this, right? <laughs> that means they're having an argument. So what's happening now is that it's more, more public. So there are those that are saying, wait a minute, you know, we were, our Communist Party is supposed to serve the people. That's the principle on which we were founded, right? And then other people, so they're arguing against the bureaucrats that are acting like bureaucrats and politicians everywhere, right? And uh, then, but are they really for the people? Well, some are and some aren't. So just like you, know, you listen to the U.S. You know, yeah. the rhetoric in the, in the elections, you can, some people are just lying to, to get power. And other people actually believe what they say. And, and what's, where's the truth in it? You know, it's always... So have they reached the crisis? Have they reached a crisis point that's caused, that's really forcing the forcing function to make yeah, it happen? Yeah. Well, they, have, or they, not they yet? are at a crisis. Yeah. I mean, the air quality is so bad; it's really hard to it's hard to live in the cities if you're used to living in California. <laughs> Although I must say, I nearly choked to death on the day after Christmas. The people were burning firewood, and, and I just I mean, my lungs were just hurting. My lungs are sensitive because I used to smoke. And that was 30 years ago, but I still, my lungs are still really sensitive. But when you go to China, do you wear a mask? Yeah. Well, you notice one of the children's paintings that's getting popular to wear a yeah. God's mask on your face. Yeah. <laughs> and that's for the smoke. Yeah. No, Pardon? That would, that would look good here, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, when you mentioned that they were moving people into the cities, in yeah. um, do you see that really as a policy move, or do you feel like it's just it's centralization for economic, economic migration of people themselves? Because I, I was actually teaching sustainable community development at a, um, a college.
college in China in 2009, and there were a lot of social problems from, you know, it's almost like you've got these old people and, and children being carried by, by their grandparents, and, you know, there's just a lot of that centralization and social impact. So, wondering what the different policy issues are around that. Yeah, it's fairly complicated, but people, it's not sustainable to live out in the West. So many people, so some people just moving to the cities to find jobs. Um, then they're also trying to just create jobs in the cities for people. And now they realize that you can't be the old high rise, uh, isolated communities where people don't have a community, they just live in a big city. So they're trying to find ways to be have more community and as part of the sustainability movement, so that's the social dimension. And it's part of happiness. I mean, of you course, see the yeah. movie called Happy, it's like what you said earlier really about community and sense of well-being. Yeah, people are happier when they are in a community, right? Right, right. And, and live longer. Right. So, I mean, I some of us, I mean, I, I grew up in, a small town, we had one acre of land, we grew our own food in the garden, we, we you know, canned and put the stuff down in the basement to keep it cool during the winter, and, and uh, we just spent a lot of time with our neighbors, and we got we knew everybody within, you know, within a half mile of where we lived, and it was just our community, and the local grocery store and all that, and now I can't even get to know the people who live in my own building. Yeah, but I don't, you know, I don't like, I don't mind living in a in a high rise. I mean, I lived in New York for a long time, and it was fine. Uh, but the sense of community is the thing that, that I miss. I think most people would. Right? So you're saying you, when you go to New York, it's a community where you live in the high rise. Yeah, when I was in New York, I was uh, actually I did get to know my neighbors more. And then, uh, but transportation was so convenient, right? We could you know, just jump on the subway and be anywhere in town. And so yeah, but you never talked to anybody on that subway up and back to Forty Side Heights, did you? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, there actually was a community sitting on that train. Right. That's except true. none of you yeah. knew that. <laughs> you, were too, you were too scared of each other. <laughs> Yeah, the well, and the muggies. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking to be cute. I was raised yeah. in Brooklyn. I know yeah. what that okay. steps yeah. like. Um, but see, I think you missed a lot of opportunities in your life. Yeah, of course. In New York, uh -huh. in terms of, if you wanted community, yeah, you could have done it. The same genius that put yeah. this material together could have taken New York apart. Yes. That's true. Well, I, I, you know, I was uh, I was going to Columbia for a while, and so I had that community. And then later, I was a professor, so I had that community. And then, and, you know, I used to hang out in Gramercy Park and down the Village and Chinatown. So I had a number of communities that I was involved in. So I loved New York. It was great. Yeah, I mean, there are there are many configurations of a community, aren't there? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean. I don't think you're saying to us by any stretch, this is a one size fits all approach to developing city. Absolutely not. I mean, the, the whole idea of an eco city is to have a whole variety of communities that um, live and work in different ways together. And also, I would think you're presenting it to us as a way of saying, look, take a New York or Chicago, yeah. Milpitas. There are lessons to be learned from this idealized situation to apply to what we already have. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I guess Megan has left. But, uh, she's from with the Sierra Club. She was back there. She's uh, Megan Flew. She's been working on transit oriented yeah. development for for yeah. the peninsula. Yeah. And, and uh, you know building communities up and down the peninsula. She has herself. Huh? Yeah, that's her job at the Sierra Club. She, best I know, she runs the email, right? She's one who signs the yeah. monthly yeah. law. Yeah, well, she's the, I think she's the only full-time employee. <laughs> so she organizes meetings, she does the email, and a whole lot of stuff. Yes? Um, I'm a technology person, 
So I'm curious, for these successful examples of eco-cities, how much of the solution is technology-based versus just good planning and flow of materials and energy? So you know, how important is efficient solar energy versus just putting thermostats in each uh, apartment? I think that's a mixed bag. You know, I just was uh, got um, an email from a guy who was he was teaching people how to make their own solar panels, and it's like it cost you a couple hundred dollars to build your own solar panels and come up. So you know, there are lots of things you can do on a small scale. But um, if you're trying to do a whole city and you want to coordinate a whole bunch of different things, then you need some some technology to coordinate it, uh, or it works better that way anyway. It depends on you. So I think we want to use technology where we can, but we don't want the technology to make us slaves. Maybe it's like skiing. Pardon? Maybe it's like skiing. Like skiing. You can integrate it here. The process versus the technology. Yeah. Right, right. Like the people who got really upset about McDonough and the, you know, the approach and coming from the outside. Yeah. Wondering how much of that was being an outsider, too. Well, just community feel right. Just two more questions because yeah. we're going to get kicked out. Okay. So. Gary. Well, I was going to throw out a comment. I think it's much less technology dependent, much more planning dependent. Yeah. You know, you could switch the technologies, solar, this, that, and uh, the planning is the key, and the, the stuff you're doing here is the key, not which technology you're going to use. You know. Yeah, like you so said, you want it to be have multiple things. That sounds enough to the United States, though. Uh, we think that technology is the only thing that's going to save us, and <laughs> we don't want to do the no, planning. And under the age of 30, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, Some the government. He showed us that map. Yeah. And California had this green dog tag. There's a lot of green building codes in, in yeah. California. And until we s send a wall up into space surrounding the whole state on the perimeter, we really are interconnected all over the place. So it's those six or seven cowboy states up in the northwest there that have zip on green. <laughs> you ought to take the presentation up there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. In fact, I'm working with a company up in uh, in Idaho that has developed a um, a waste energy process that they're there you go. You know, really good, and they're yeah. doing some. They're selling some of that in China. Yeah, God forbid so, yeah. we have a reshuffle of the deck in personal opinion in 2000 and whatever it is, 12, 13. We're going to regress again, aren't we? Yeah. And that's, it would be, be well, deep doo-doo. Yeah, doo -doo. yeah, well, things do happen in cycles. Yes, they do. Right? So yes, they do. Some of us uh, see the cycle before it's going to hit. We want to kind of avoid it. Well, stuff the ballot yeah. box. It's a good start. Right. Uh, I think we should all yeah. stop and applaud yeah. before everybody else leaves. So, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jim. That was great. So, I'm not going to I'm not going to hold everybody down by telling anybody about SBII. Just read our website. And, well, that's uh, all cool you. too. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. This one. So that he talks about here in the Lit Square and, and the Municipal Green Building Program and the new development for remodeling the law. San Francisco Academy of Science is yeah. unbelievable that place. Green. If you haven't green been there, uh, it's just amazing what they've done with that building. You what, see but the, the roof. cost of that building is so incredible. Wasn't it something like ten thousand dollars per square foot? Uh -huh. And I imagine the, the carbon impact of that was monstrous as well. Yeah, so there's that full cycle issue that we talked about earlier. So it, it cost them a lot to build that thing, but now that it's done, it's uh, very energy efficient and everything's it's demonstrating what can be done. So, yeah, there's, there's always some trade offs. Yeah, but I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a boondoggle. Yeah. <laughs> well, it may have been a boondoggle, but it was worth it because of the example. It's just wonderful, the experience of going there. And and the for yeah. May not have ever worked as a private venture. <laughs> right, right. 
But okay, so that's part of the issue with sustainable development is that the early ones, I mean, everything costs more when you first do it, right? Once you get the thing down and you can do repeat it and just adapt it to the local circumstances, then it's much cheaper. Right. Right. So somebody's gotta take that initial risk and and this is what I you know you hear argument in, in Congress all the time. So well, that's too expensive where people yeah. are saying, Well what about the Okay, we shouldn't build a high speed rail here. Right. Or we shouldn't fix a roof. You know, we yeah. Have a roof right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And people say, Oh well let's let's just, you know, make the highways bigger. Why should we spend money on a train? Yeah. Well, the longer we wait, the more it's gonna to cost to do it, and sooner or later, I mean the cars just keep filling up the highway no matter what. And when I go to Europe or something, I, I love riding around on the train, going places on the subway and all that. I lived in New York, I went to Columbia. I, was, I took a car to New York, stupid me. <laughs> <laughs> car to New York, yeah. like sand on the beach. There used to be a trolley system all around here. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, yeah, Los Angeles had a wonderful trolley system yeah. in the old days. So, so, yeah, an initial yeah. project like that, uh, Electric it, it's, it's, yeah. it's maybe an unfair criticism to talk about that because it's a first out of the shoot as far as the yeah. economics of it. There will be payback in right. replications. Oh, there's always so. Uh, well, isn't, doesn't GM have some project in Tianjin to make these little pod cars, these little electric right. pod cars? Really? Thanks. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of different stories going on, but and that's the thing about de developing an eco city is very complex. There are a lot of dimensions to it, and so not everyone's going to be perfect. And in fact, uh, you know, if something isn't going wrong, then you don't have any chance to improve things, right? Yeah. And no matter what you do, when you do one thing, it's going to have an impact somewhere that you don't know about until you see it, and then you have to go fix it. So you need to be just aware that that might happen, and then be ready. And then, what makes people happy is solving problems. Yeah, it's kind of funny. When I was in China, I was teaching Murphy's laws and all the corollaries, and <laughs> got called in to the party secretary's office and said, "We don't teach pessimism here." <laughs> <laughs> it's not pessimism. <laughs> but then I explained to him that actually the, the kids are the children of high party officials, and they blame the party for everything that goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It's Murphy. And and in fact, Murphy's laws are, are optimism. Yeah, Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Anticipating things are going to go wrong, so you have something to do to think about fixing it. Yeah. And then enjoy doing that. Right. Okay. So this is Bill McDonough, a very famous architect of eco cities, and he's done you know, some major good projects. He did the Ford Motor Company thing up in. Detroit rebuilt the whole plant with a green roof and all that. And, uh, he's done a lot of great stuff, but he's kind of <coughs> full of himself, too. <laughs> so he decided he was going to go to China and help them. And he got there, um, and he talked them into doing 12 eco cities. And um, one of the things that they said was, okay, 400 million people are going to move into cities. Uh, and he said, well, let's do a mass energy balance on that. <laughs> if you build all those buildings out of concrete, you're not going to have any any dirt left, and you're not going to have uh, any coal left either because you're going to burn up all your coal. So why don't you do it more sustainably? Okay. So he said it could be done, 400 million people, if you do it right. Uh, and then he, one of the projects he took on was a city called Huangbaiyu up in northeast China. It was a farming village and he was going to remake it into a sustainable village. And uh, trouble in Huangbaiyu, it didn't work. So, and he got Deng Xiaoping's daughter to partner with him on that. Um, and so now they don't want to admit it that it doesn't work, but it doesn't. What didn't work about it? Pardon? What didn't work about it? What didn't work? Yeah, a lot of things. Okay, what exactly happened? Well, a student who worked on the project uh, did a, a PhD research on what went wrong. <laughs> and well, there are a number of things. Uh, 
conflicts of interest, desire for rapid scale, personal, personal aggrandizement, persistently global perspective, technical inexperience, faulty materials, lack of oversight, poor communication, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, he's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but besides that, how was it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, now one of the basic problems was that American companies are not allowed to build anything in China. They have to subcontract to Chinese companies. And the Chinese companies would subcontract, in this instance, they subcontracted the building to farmers during the off season. Um, whoops. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well there. yeah. <laughs> and this was a farming village, and they were building three-story buildings. Yeah. And people couldn't keep their pigs underneath their front porch, <laughs> so they wouldn't move in. So one of the big problems in China is that they don't. I mean, one of the big problems we have is that we have NIMBY. All the all the stakeholders object to everything, so it's hard to do anything. In China, they don't tell anybody that they're going to do it. They just build it, and then they say, okay, move in. But people still rebel. <laughs> so they, there needs to be a happy medium in there where you get the stakeholders involved and, and get them, you know, find what their objections are and then help overcome those objections, help them see what's in their own best interest, or help them teach you what's in their best interest, whatever. But trying to, either way, you know, if you try to go just all one side or one the other, then you get trouble. Okay, so the color what, what is in Hangbaiyu? Pardon? I mean, what is there? Oh, it's a farming village up near the Korean border. No, but you, you said it, it failed, so if yeah. you go there, what do you see that is evidence of its failure? Oh, they built a few of these buildings that nobody would move into. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so the town was, they built this town in this farming village, and then people would move in. And part of it, because they weren't used to that kind of a building, part of it is because they were falling apart because the construction was poor. <laughs> so, now, could they learn from that and just redo it? Yes. And that's really the secret, right? To progress. Make mistakes. Make all the mistakes you can. Learn from them and don't make them again. If you won't admit that you made a mistake, then you're going to make the same mistake again. Uh, but it's kind of not in Chinese culture to admit your mistakes in public. Um, <laughs> and lots of us Americans have that same problem. Right? It just looks like that, that was not an integrated approach. Are you talking about just a couple of buildings as opposed to a whole community or, I mean, right? It wasn't the design. It wasn't, yeah. It wasn't, yeah, it it wasn't, wasn't the design, design. It was about the politics and the execution. Well, yeah. Yeah. So the design so wasn't for it to be an integrated project, but right. the execution was a fragmented project. Right, okay. But it wasn't good enough. Yeah, right. So do right things and do things right. Right, exactly. Good design. Very good. That's good. Yeah. Do right things and do things right. Yeah, right. Okay. So, I'm sorry. So this is Heller Manis was a company that hired me as a consultant. And they have, uh, last year they had these, uh, Nine different projects all over China. They're How many of them got built? Pardon? How many of them got built? They're in process of being built. All nine? Yeah, in various stages. So the Guangzhou, they did two projects in Guangzhou, the North Axis and the South Axis, and you can find on the website the pictures and everything. Uh, very beautiful and very nicely done. Now they got done because the purpose of it was to, uh, to do it for the World Games which were held last year in Guangzhou. So they actually got that one done, for those two. And Nansha is just about 100 miles south of that. So it's uh, because they have a good reputation for working on in Guangzhou, then they also got the inside track on doing Nansha as well. But an inside track means actually the Guangzhou Planning Institute had already been working on it for five years, so they had a lot of the work done already. What they wanted, what the, what the, uh, okay, it's, it's on the Pearl River Delta, and actually, I'll get into that. So this is their, their mandate, they said, this is what we're going to do with this place. It's at the convergence of two major rivers, and it breaks up into eight 
small rivers as they go out into the sea and it's a complex river system. Uh, ec ecological, uh, very fragile because <coughs> the land is eroding and washing out of the ocean. Uh, sediment deposited everywhere. They've got tidal wetlands, mountain vegetations, and so on. Climate disaster prone, typhoons, floods, and so forth happened there. Uh, sewage is a big problem. So all those things they mapped out. Okay, these are the problems, and then they went, they went further, and they said, okay, uh, this is an ideal place because it is right at the juncture of okay, Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, and it reaches into the Pearl River Delta, and and Hong Kong is like a port for the rest of the world, so it's a place that like everybody could come together. So it's an ideal place to show off what we can do, and also to ha have maximum impact. And this is kind of interesting. Uh, these are global uh, climate change predictions, and, and um, so they planned this out. And you notice that IPCC in 2000 said that by 2100, it was it could, <coughs> sea level could rise 58 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And then the Chinese state oceanic administration said by 2050, it could rise 50 <coughs> centimeters. Pretty different number or half the time. And then the Chinese Academy of Science did a study of the Pearl River Delta, and they said 65 centimeters by uh, 2050. So then you're going to, so even scientists trying to predict what's going to happen with global time, climate change, they can't be sure, but everyone has a different, because they have a different metric. But in any case, um, so 65 centimeters is just about, what, almost two meters. Two feet. Two feet. Pardon? Two feet. Two feet? Two feet? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. 100 centimeters is, yeah. a, is the meter. It's two feet. Yeah. Okay, so two feet. you got to know that it's planned coastal city. It's between 2050 and 2100. That's 50 years difference in there. Yeah. Right? So, in any case, so they, they should plan for at least two feet just to be safe and, and uh, might as well, you know. Two meters. <laughs> yeah, might as well. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with that later. Okay, so there's just mapping out, you know, the region, and then, so this is a um, innovation park that's being built there as part of the Nansha project, and the innovation park is going to be a joint venture between international universities and and companies to develop um, ecologically uh, friendly technologies. And uh, so that's the plan. That's the vision. Do you know what the price tag of this thing is? Uh, don't, not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> but it all depends on how many people get involved and how many companies invest and all that. But they're going to do it in stages. Is, is there a story behind that depiction of a bird there? Or is, sort of a, is that some guiding principle reflected? Well, it's kind of like Okay, this, that's the Pearl River Delta, and it's kind of like could be a landing place for all these internationally interested in a visit. I see, yeah, yeah. landing. Okay, so then they plan the ecological city. They got you know wind and solar and biomass energy and low carbon uh, settlements and water village and wetland reserve and all that's kind of planned into the grand master plan of it. And now KPIs, right? These are the measurements that, that they, they say, okay, we are targeting this level for all these different measurements. So they set these targets for, for um, uh, carbon safety and health and all the different indicators that they're going to measure. So it's a fairly complicated uh, hmm. project, but that tells me you kind of need a lot of good computers and databases and so on, right? Which are all in the plan, but uh, no, this is a company that I'm working with. It's, um, I try to bring other companies in when they have something to offer to make it a better place. So um, um, this system is a, it's a way of measuring the, car, the emissions, various kinds of emissions from boats, ships, trains, cars, 
uh, power plants, and so forth. And it's all done based on just gathering all the data about the, uh, what fuel they use and how efficient they are in, in using that fuel. And then having a model that calculates so they can predict exactly how it's going to come out. And, and keep track of all the pollution so that people then will have an ability to manage the pollution and the efficiency of their systems. So the plan, of course, is that it's not ever going to be a perfectly done package. It's going to be continually evolving, always learning new things. Things happen, things go wrong, then figure out a new way and solve that and keep moving forward. So the plan is for it to be a continuously evolving process. Now, just by comparison, it, in the United States, these are um, cities that, are, that have plans to do, like they have standards or programs for eco development. You notice California is way ahead of the rest of the country. So this just like we're not totally in the dark while they're yeah. trying to madly develop in China. We're do, we're doing quite a few things too, uh, but they don't get as much publicity. Uh, here's one that I visited in UC Davis. It's a net zero energy village. So, you know, that can be done. And they did it, actually, they use Hanley Solar. And everybody likes it. Pardon? Everybody likes it. Every, of course, they yeah. love it. It's clean. It it's, works. They got the power they need and so on. But it's like not nearly as complete a plan as the oh, yeah. non project. Right. And in fact, One solar. So, right? Energy, yeah. And, and they should. At least they use ground source geothermal. And I asked him about that. And he said, "What's that?" Wow! <laughs> oh boy! Jeez! Do you ask the people in Davis who asked them? Yeah. Oh so my Davis. God! They didn't know. Yeah. Um, well, they, I mean, they they designed it for their faculty and students. Yeah. And that was about all they could manage in their planning process, I guess. But yeah, it, was it was a decade ago or so, a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. But do uh, they have farming stuff, right, too? I mean, not just... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Local, local uh, agriculture, so they, they produce their own food. But it's not as many dimensions as you showed us. Right. Exactly. All those things yeah. weren't considered, I think. Still, they're net zero energy, very comfortable, yeah. right? The natural lighting is very good. Uh, it's a very pleasant place, yeah. What's ground source geothermal? Pardon? What is ground source geothermal? What is ground source geothermal? That's uh, capturing the heat or the temperature difference between 15 feet down and what's in the air on the surface, and using that difference by circulating water through there or some fluid uh, and a heat pump, and capturing that energy. The average temperature is about 55. Yeah, so that's about 15 degrees difference from the surface. It's usually a way and to that's heat all you need. Usually right? a way to heat and cool your buildings. Yeah, yeah it right. works best if you've got big range. It's really yeah. hot and really cold. Right. It works in power activity. Yeah. yeah. So one example in the Bay Area is um, uh, Ohlone College in Newark, is it? Uh, yeah. uh, Fremont? Fremont. Fremont. No, it's a Fremont-ish. Fremont-ish. Fremont yeah. <laughs> so it's on the Bay side of the 101. So coming up oh, of 80. 80. Yeah, 80 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they have, they have a combination of wind, solar, ground source geothermal, natural lighting, air exchangers. And so they, they're off the grid for three or four months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And it's very comfortable campus. And the tuition's going up. <laughs> well, so, where, where, where isn't it? Right? Can't let them all. Can't let them all. <laughs> where isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, oh, thank you. Thank you.